This month we've been going through the series of uh, the fruit of the spirit, and uh, today I want to talk about kindness. Right? We we know that this year has been a, a crazy year. We've been seeing just if you watch the news, you see all the stuff that's going on and all this uncertainty that's in this world today. But I tell you what, God is faithful. He's faithful because he's consistent. The Bible says he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, he's, he, he, this, this year didn't take him by surprise. Uh, everything going on, and whether it's in the political field or with this pandemic, it, it, nothing took him by surprise. God knows all. He sees all. And he's been consistent uh, in our lives as believers, no matter what storm, no matter what trial we might have gone through this year. Where God is faithful because he's consistent to who he is. See, we as believers, we have a relationship with God. We know God. We know God intimately. We, we, we can pray to God. We can seek God. We can have a, a close friendship with God. It's not that we just heard about God. It's not that we just heard stories about him. But we have an actual heartfelt relationship with our Lord and Savior. And, and that's the thing is that how do we know that God is a provider? By having experienced his provision, Right? How, how do we know that God is a healer? He's a, the great physician by having experienced his healing. How do we know that uh, God is merciful? Because our sins are forgiven. Because he sent his son Jesus. And how do we know that God is good? Well, it's because we've experienced his loving kindness. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, there's 23 and 25. It says now, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. We could bow our heads and just... uh, Ask God to get involved in, in, in this message. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your provision. We thank you for just uh, this arena that you have set, your presence, Lord, uh, through the worship of your name, God. We just ask and pray that tonight, Lord, you would just speak to our hearts, God. Minister to us, Father God. Let me decrease and you increase, Father. In the name of your son, Jesus, we all say amen. So we're talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and that's Pastor Richard and Brother Matt explained, it's not the fruits, but the fruit, and the fruit that has different characteristics. I have a lemon tree, just to kind of give a little illustrated sermon here. I have a lemon tree, and let's see if the camera can see that. That lemon came from the tree, but so did this lemon. And believe it or not, so did this lemon. Now, these are different lemons, different stages, but they're each different. Each have their own characteristic, but they're all lemons. And they all came from the exact same tree, same roots, some of them even the same branches. And as believers, there are certain fruits that are evident in our lives because we know the same God, because we serve the same Savior. And those fruits have different character, excuse me, that fruit has different characteristics in our lives. And tonight we're talking about kindness, the fruit of kindness, or the characteristic of kindness. As born-again believers, we've been given a new life. Through the Word of God, our minds are renewed, our hearts that were once a heart of stone, of rock, now the Bible says that it's a heart of flesh, it's soft in the Master's hand, Right? We've been given a new life and a new character. And how do you know that? It's because we're conforming into the image of Christ. It's what Christian means is Christ follower, Christ-like. How many know that when we're conforming into the image of Christ and becoming more like Jesus, that means that something has to die. It means that the old flesh, the old nature, that old guy needs to die needs to be put on a cross because that flesh wants to sabotage what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives. That flesh wants to war against what God is trying to do in our lives, in our homes, and in our marriages. I was listening to this uh, 
I guess it was a podcast. Uh, uh, this, this Christian was interviewing a Christian rapper turned atheist. So I, I started to listen to his testimony, I guess, in reverse, right? And as I was listening to this individual, it began to dawn on me, it's not that this individual didn't believe in God anymore, because the Bible says only a fool says in his heart there is no God, right? It's that as somewhere along the line, he didn't want to pay the price. Somewhere along the line, he didn't want to allow himself to be conformed into the image of the God that he was rapping about. He was talking about how his mentor, after a show uh, one day, he was a young teenager, early adult, that his mentor brought him aside, and he says, uh, he says you've, you've got a lot of talent, and God's going to use you and wants to continue to use you, but it would be good if you showed some humility in your life. And this young man, he thought to himself, he didn't need that. You know, he rejected what was uh, be, trying to be imparted into his life, and as a result, he began to fade away. And, and it, it, what it was is that he was just unwilling to allow God to work in his life. He was unwilling to let the Spirit of God do what he wanted to do in his life. You know, God's Word, it's not burdensome. It's liberating. There's freedom in God's word. We, we think like, oh, you know, it, the Bible, it's about what I can and can't do. It's no, that's the freedom that we have, the liberty that we have through the word of God. The world's rules are burdensome. They like guilt and they, they shame and they age us and they, they restrict us. That the world's view, the world's rules, that's what truly puts us in a bondage, but the word of God frees us and it liberates us. And that's why it's so important that we align ourselves with the word of God. You ever driven a car that's out of alignment? It just pulls to the left or pulls to the right instead of going straight? And that's what happens to us in our lives when our lives are out of alignment with God's word. We'll begin to pull to one way or to the other. And aligning ourselves with God's word brings benefit to our lives. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 17, it says, Those who are kind benefit themselves, but the cruel bring ruin on themselves. I think sometimes that kindness is one of those characteristics of the fruit that might be overlooked or might be underrated. Sometimes people mistake kindness for weakness. And I tell you, though, if you're a kind person, you are not a weak person. In fact, you're a strong person, that the Spirit of God is at work within your life and, and is using you to bless others. And, and sometimes you might feel a little bit underappreciated, but God sees those kind acts that you do in secret, and God sees uh, what you do for him, uh, for others in his name. I looked up uh, this generic definition of kindness and so the quality of being friendly or generous or considerate but the biblical idea of kindness is the idea of goodness in action it's a sweetness of disposition a gentleness in dealing with others the word describes the ability to act for the welfare of those taxing your patience you ever have your patience taxed Right? Today, my patience was taxed in so many different areas. God knew what I was going to be speaking on. A couple benefits of kindness besides just being a good testimony is that kindness, a kind act, can change the atmosphere of a room. It can lift the person up. It, maybe someone is down or maybe someone is discouraged and a kind word or a kind act can, can just change uh, the atmosphere in, in that place and change that individual and, and make them see something different. There's a study at the University of British Columbia and they found that Kindness, doing acts of kindness uh, increases your energy, your happiness, your lifespan, pleasure. They were seeing that uh, acts of kindness increase the levels of that love hormone called oxytocin, which plays as that bonding hormone, right? Evident mother in a child, right? It, it increases the hormone serotonin which stabilizes our moods and feelings of well-being and happiness. 
You know, it, it enables the brain cells and our other nervous system cells to communicate with one another. That guy on the street corner that was uh, saying there's no high like the most high, he wasn't lying. People who are kind are high on life. There's uh, something inside of them. And, and, you know, if you think about a person that's kind, think about somebody who's kind. And you think about this person, maybe they always got this joyful disposition and they're always encouraging and they're always doing things uh, for people, whether they get credit or not, right? I think we could all think of someone like that. Kindness, acts of kindness, it decreases pain and stress, depression and anxiety. In that same study, they got a group of highly anxious individuals, and they told these individuals, uh, uh, for the next few weeks, uh, six days out of the week, we want you to do an act of kindness to somebody. And they saw that after a month, there was a significant increase in positive moods, relationship satisfaction, and there there was a decrease in social avoidance. Someone said, there are three ways to ultimate success. The first way is to be kind. The second way is to be kind. And the third way is to be kind. You know who said that? Mr. Rogers. (laughs) Right? And you think about Mr. Rogers, always had a smile on his face, always as well, just temp- mild temperament. Just, you never think of Mr. Rogers as being angry or mad, right? And he says that the key to success is being kind. You know, the world would say opposite, though. The world would say that, uh, that kindness is weakness. The world would say that it's a uh, dog-eat-dog. The world will say that you got to do to them before they do to you. And that's because kindness doesn't come from the world. Kindness flows from God. In the book, we know that, that uh, God is love, right? And in 1 Corinthians, we're told that love is kind. And God is kind to his creation. He's kind to us, church. He's kind to his children. He's, he's kind to us. He didn't create us to torture us. He didn't create us to make our lives miserable. But he created us as an expression of his glory. He created us so that we can worship and praise him and have a, a, a fellowship and a, and a closeness with him. As a teenager, I had this ill perception of who God was. I didn't know God. Uh, when I was a, a young teenager, and I just had this image of God just taking notes. He did this. He said that, and just taking notes, and at the right time, boom, he was going to drop the hammer. That was my ignorance of who God was. I didn't know that God was a loving God, that he was a merciful God. Book of Isaiah, chapter 48, 54, verse 8. It says, in a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Oh, the Lord, your Redeemer. What an awesome name for God, amen. What this was saying, that everlasting kindness is that, yeah, out of the kindness of his heart, he has compassion on his children and redeems us and redeems our mistakes and failures. Anybody ever make a mistake here? Everybody, anybody ever fall short here? The Lord, your redeemer, what, he's able to take that mess that we make and clean us up and say, listen, I'm going to put you back on the right track, man. He redeems what the world calls broken, and he redeems what the world calls trash, and he says, there's something valuable in this. I'll tell you that God is not random. Right, we hear that random, random acts of kindness, right? Uh, Honda made a whole marketing scheme out of it, right? Random acts of helpfulness. But God isn't random. God knows what we need and when we need it, amen? God doesn't just spin a wheel and say, what am I going to bless this guy with? Okay, all right, you know, we're going to bless him with the free meal. No, God knows, he, and he knows because he's, he's we're, he knows us because we're his creation. Today, I have a... Um, I have this old uh, El Camino, and every now and then, it sits a lot, so every now and then I have to drive it, right? And um, the gas gauge doesn't work, and I know it doesn't work because when I put my blinker, the gas gauge moves. (laughs) But I figured I had enough gas in there, and let's get it moving around, and what happened was um, all of a sudden it just stalled on me. And it stalled on me right here in front of the church as I was going down the hill, 
And I had just enough momentum to get up to the hill and block the driveway to this bu um, business right here, a classic, a classicado or a classificado, something like that. And I was like, man. And people were honking at me, and they were yelling at me, and they were telling me that I was number one. And I was thinking, this is. And then I hear a guy honking at me. And I turn around, I look at him, and, and he says something to me, and I just ignored him. I turned around, and I was on the phone with uh, AAA, and I was thinking, this is embarrassing, man. Then I turn around again, the guy honks at me again, and I'm like, I can't do nothing, I'm stuck. And then I look, it was Brother Andy, my hero, man. He says, I know, it's me, man. Long story short, he got me some gas, and he gave me an escort to the gas station. That was not a random act of kindness. God put him right where he needed to be to bless me right at that right time. And you know what? It felt good to be the blessee, but I tell you what, sometimes God's going to use you to be the blesser. God's going to use you to be that one that performs that kind act uh, on someone who is, is stuck in Imperial Highway in the middle of traffic. <laughs> See, kindness of God, it prepares us and it leads us to repentance. You read the book of Romans chapter 2 verse 4. It says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? I encourage you to read those uh, first 11 verses of that chapter. Because God is, is basically saying um, he's given us a way. He's saying because if we want to live according to our own standards, if we want to live uh, in a way that is sinful or displeasing to God, and if we don't come to a place in our lives where we repent of that, there is a penalty that has to be paid. But because of the goodness of God, he doesn't desire that we pay it. He put it on his son Jesus. He put that penalty of our sin. He put that penalty of our failures. He put that penalty of all the wrong that we've ever done. And he, and he put it on his son, Jesus, because he's a good God. He's a God that loves us, a God that created us, uh, not so that we could be separated from him, but so that we can uh, have fellowship with him. And it's that kindness, that mercy that he has uh, that allows us to come to a place in our lives and say, God, forgive me of my sins. It's at that place at salvation where we realize that uh, all our sins were put on Jesus Christ that we realize just how good a God he is and he wills the Bible says that none should perish but all come to a place of repentance some people say how can a loving loving God send someone to hell God doesn't send anyone to hell he made a way of escape his name is Jesus because he's so good even when we were dead in our sins, the Bible said, when we were enemies of God, he reconciled us through his son, Jesus. Book of Titus, chapter 3, it says, But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank God for his kindness, but sometimes uh, I'll tell you this, that kindness might not come in a form that we would necessarily expect. Book of Psalms, chapter 141, verse 5, it says, Let the righteous strike me, and it shall be a kindness. Let him rebuke me, and it shall, it shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it, for still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. When we think about being struck, we don't think about that as a kind act, right? But what the Bible is saying here is that sometimes uh, someone is being kind to you. You might not understand that at, at first. But if you were to hear what they're saying, if you would hear their, their warning or their advice, you would realize they're trying to spare you from something. If I was to go to Brother Jojo and say, you know, I love singing for God. I 
I have a passion to sing for God. I think I'm going to quit my career and become a musician. Nicely, he would probably say, you know, Manny, God loves to hear you sing. But kindness, he would say, but don't quit your day job. Because that's not your call. And Brother Manny, although God loves to hear you sing, maybe not everybody else might, man. It's not being mean. He's being kind. He's sparing me from a possible decision that would really be regrettable down the line. See, there's a difference between being nice and being kind. Nice makes us feel comfortable, makes us feel all warm and fuzzy. Nice tickles us. But kindness, there's a difference there. They say that nice wants to please people, is worried about being pleased where kindness wants to please God. Nice doesn't want to rock the boat, but kindness will not only rock the boat, it'll create the waves that rocks the boat. Nice doesn't want to upset or speak up when it witnesses wrong behavior, but kindness will do what is right, even if some get upset. I'm reminded about the woman with the, uh, who anointed Jesus with the expensive oil. She's at the house of uh, um, Simon the leper, and it's, on the, uh, it's close to the crucifixion of Jesus, and, and she comes in with this expensive oil, and she begins to anoint Jesus with that oil. And, and the whole room begins to smell like that fragrant oil, and, and the Bible says that some of his disciples began to get angry. They began to get upset. They were, they were indignant about this act of kindness that this woman was doing to Jesus. And they said, why did you waste that, that expensive, uh, fragrant oil? You could have sold it and given it to the poor. The Bible says it was Judas who said that. And, and it wasn't that Judas cared about the poor. Judas was angry because this act of kindness was shown to, shown to Jesus because he was a taker, not a giver. He was used to stealing uh, out of that money bag, and and he just saw that this act of kindness, uh, that was an opportunity for him to get rich. He was a a taker and not a giver. And sometimes being nice can be superficial, polite, but sometimes kindness can cost us. And can I tell you that kindness is worth the cost? Book of Romans 18, uh, uh, 20, and 21. It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Uh, In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When I read that, I I would think that, uh, you know, when you do that to someone who would say they're your enemy, but if you're giving them something to eat or drink, uh, that just that guilt uh, and the shame of what they did would be like coals on their head, right? And, I, and, 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 and yes, there's, there's truth in that. And I like that because it, it, it just, you know, you did me wrong. I want you to suffer just a little bit. Just a little bit. I want you to get a taste of what you did to me, right? That's human nature. That's my nature. Just experience for a second what you put me through. How many of you know? My, my ways aren't God's ways, amen. God's ways aren't our ways, amen. I was reading in this uh, Bible knowledge commentary. It gave this insight. And it kind of gave, gave me an insight into the mindset of God. Paul was quoting the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 22. He was saying that it teaches that if the fire of your enemy goes out, and they come asking for a coal to relight their fire. Instead of turning them away or giving them just one, you should be extravagantly generous. We're instructed to give our enemies so many burning coals that they have to carry them the way burdens are carried in the Middle East, in a container on the head. And they can go back and immediately bake their bread without having to wait for wood to become suitable coals for cooking. Coals on the head was a neighborly act, a kind act. It made friends and not enemies. And when I read that, I said, man, that's good, man, but 
just a little bit, couldn't they? Uh, but what, what, what was being said here was, look it, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And if your enemy's fire has gone out, give him that which he needs to stir that fire again. Give him that which he needs to stir that passion for Jesus Christ again. Give him that which he needs to have that zeal once again. He was saying, meet, meet his need. Meet her need wherever they're at. Frederick Faber said, kindness has converted more sinners than zeal, eloquence, or learning. Thomas Fuller said, kindness is the noblest weapon to conquer with. Not too long ago, uh, I was at a funeral of a, of a brother that passed away from our congregation. One of his brothers was given a testimony about all that God had been doing in this man's life and just the powerful way that God was using him. And he said something that just blew me away. He said that there was an assault, an attempt made on this man's life. And what was his response? It wasn't that of revenge. It wasn't that of scheming to come against him or getting him, getting them before they got him again. What, what was his response to this assault? So he led these men to the Lord. He converted them. He shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He told them about the love and the mercy of God and the kindness of God. And these men that at one point were his enemy, they're now brothers. That's the kindness of God. That's the goodness of God. That's the mercy of God. What an awesome testimony. I heard that. Oh, man, I just, man, God is so merciful, so good. He's so good. See, as I wind this down, as the worship team comes up, from the book of Genesis to Revelation, the central theme of, of, of the word of God is God's redemption plan. It's God's plan for salvation. It's God's plan to restore and to redeem and to make us whole. Book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. Verses 1 through 4. It says, At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness, and I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. That's the God that we know. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that loves us, the Bible says, with an everlasting love, and has drawn us to him with unfailing kindness. You know, church, I don't know about you, but I think I've witnessed and experienced enough anger and hatred and malice to last a lifetime. I want to begin to experience the kindness of God. I want to be able to, to begin to show the kindness of God and the love of God. And watch what God does, man. And watch what God does in our lives and how he's going to fill this tent. Sunday we were packed out, man. You know. And God's going to continue. He's going to continue. Because we're a church that has experienced his love. We're a church that has experienced his mercy. And we're a church uh, that hasn't forgotten the heartbeat of God. And that's the people. And that's those that are out there that are looking for an answer and saying, there's got to be more to, to, to life than all this. There is. His name is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. If we could have our heads bowed and our eyes closed in reverence to God.